Okay, our next presenter is, uh, is a friend of mine that I've, I've known for some years. He's a member of the World Explorers Club. Uh, his name is Doug Nason. He's an anthropologist. He owns a popular art gallery in Los Angeles called the Copro Nason Gallery. Uh, he's the author of, of a number of books. His first book was called Night of the Tiki, published by Last Gasp. Uh, his second book was called uh, Rat Fink, The Art of Big Daddy Roth, also published by Last Gaps, and his new book that's coming out is, is called Von Dutch, An American Dream. And so a warm welcome now for Doug Nason. Thanks, David. It's really a pleasure to speak um, in front of a, such a distinguished group and among some, such uh, great scholars and sages. So hopefully uh, this will be a little bit of levity and a little bit of intellectualism. And um, the topic is tiki. Um, I first became interested in tiki when I was about seven years old and my uncle came back from Haiti and brought me a little trinket voodoo doll. I was very fascinated with, um, with this anthropomorphic, primitive, rudimentary, you know, bare, bare bones, you know, uh, image of a, of a human. And around the same time, uh, my parents would take me out to a restaurant uh, called Kelbo's and it was a Polynesian themed, uh, real tacky, nautical, maritime uh, restaurant, but it was anchored by several of these, these icons, these tiki icons, these wooden effigies. And my parents enjoyed it because they, they could drink you know, some fancy tropical drinks and there's enough stuff in there for me to be entertained, you know, getting lost amongst, amongst the uh, nautical decor in the place. And so that's kind of what set, set me off uh, in this uh, journey on tiki's. And then when I got into college, I majored in anthropology, in particular, interested in these anthropomorphic forms. And finally, uh, when I got out of school and had enough money to start traveling, I, I uh, went to the Pacific a lot and um, was able to, to look at some tiki's in their natural uh, element. Move on to the next one. Uh, before we, we, we go into the Pacific, I want to just talk a little bit about uh, the, 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 what I call a tiki Americana component, which was these tiki bars that were popular after our boys got back from World War II. And then a new uh, resurgence in what I call tiki uh, primitivism, which is uh, new artists, contemporary artists doing tiki Im images. This, this image is called Tiki Bars by an artist that we work with named The Piz. And this one's called uh, Taboo, and it's um, uh, by an artist named Von Franco. This is the cover of my first book, which we call Night of the Tiki. And um, basically, this shows the three schools, at least the three schools that I believe that Tiki is. The first component, uh, the Tongaroa here from the Cook Islands, these are all Tongaroa images, but this is the traditional one with the traditional tattoos on it. And that's a Cook Islands image that we'll be getting into in a little while. But that represents the, t the t what I call tiki traditional, the, the traditional um, uh, icons of the Pacific, which this le lecture is about. The other two schools is this is the tiki Americana. This is a Leroy Schmaltz who um, single-handedly uh, decorated several tiki bars during the uh, 1950s and 60s. He also did a set of Gelligan's Island and, um, and all kinds of uh, TV and, and motion pictures. And he's, uh, he's been decorating tiki or Polynesian themed things for the last 40 years. And finally, the new school of tiki art, the tiki contemporary primit primitivism, represented by an artist named Shag, who's phenomenally popular and our, our gallery is very fortunate to work with. And then um, I, I need to first talk a little bit about romantic, the romantic notion. Um, obviously, as most, most people in this room, I need to tell you my slant is I, I'm definitely um, uh, a diffusionist. I, I believe the world is a very small place and modern or primitive man was, was getting around a lot easier than, than uh, most academics um, believe. But uh, my other bias is um, I am a romantic. I, I believe in the noble savage, Rousseau and the noble savage as opposed to the eth ethnocentrism that was going on in the um, 1800s and 1900s in the European expansion. So finally, we're here in the Marquesas. The Marquesas Islands, I wanted to begin here. This is um, the land of tiki. The word tiki um, is from the Marquesas, and the word tattoo is also from the Marquesas. This is the biggest tiki in the world, the biggest ancient tiki in the world outside of, uh, outside of Easter Island. And uh, this tiki is called Takai. And going, here's another view of, um, 
Takai was um, ex, ex, uh, a great example of, of mythology meeting history. Uh, tiki is really the confluence or the crossroads of oceanic art, history, and religion. It's kind of just the icon that represents all these, these meetings um, coming into one icon. Uh, Takai, here, here you see how big it is. There, there I am uh, standing next to him. Um, Takai was a, was, a, was a famous king um, that lived at least five or 600 years ago. And he was such a powerful king and such a strong warrior that when he died, they deified him into this tiki. And that's basically what tikis are. They could be a representation of a, of a, of a leader of a lineage or they could be a represent, representative of uh, something between man and God, an intermediary, or a representation of God himself. This, this Takai Tiki in the Marquesas, again, it was a living man. They deified him, and now he's something akin to a, to a god. And this is the same uh, site in Hivaoa in the southern Marquesas Islands, uh, right standing next to Takai are two very unique um, tikis. This one's uh, actually... Uh, laying on its belly, and some believe it's a female tiki possibly giving, giving birth. It's a very unique tiki in front. And the, the tiki in back um, is a, this, this whole site was ex excavated by Thor Heyerdahl in the um, late 1950s. And unfortunately, the head of the one in back here, the, the head now, is the real head is believed to be in a museum in Germany. But this, is, this head seemed to fit on, it, on the form fine. But the site is called Puamau, and it's a very important tiki site in the Marquesas. And th this is another example. This is also on the same island of Hivaoa in the southern Marquesas, but it's a great example of the mythology and the, um, the, the, the folklore behind tiki. Just like in America, we might have like tall tales, like say uh, Paul Bunyan, you know, was like this lumberjack that was probably a real guy at some time, and just threw. Through, through myths and, and folklore and the quote tall tales, he became such a, you know, he became a giant and just a, a very important figure. And that's kind of the way uh, some of these uh, deified tikis became. This is called the Moaione um, tiki, and it's just a small tiki. It sits on a, on a, a mare, or in the Marquesas, they call them mies, and they're the open air temples that are found throughout Polynesia, especially uh, eastern Polynesia. And this tiki has lots of folklore surrounding it. It sits up above the ocean, but one story is that um, it will go down to the ocean at nighttime and sleep on the sand. Moai Oni actually means sleep sand in Marquesan. And, uh, and then, then before everybody gets up in the morning, it goes back up to its, its Mie home. Another, uh, it's also called the fisherman's tiki because uh, when the fish aren't biting, sometimes the, the, the fisherman will actually take it down to the beach and the tiki supposedly mysteriously points in the direction where the fish are biting. And there's a lot of different stories. Uh, some people, of course, uh, you've probably heard stories like this before, but some people have said they posed next to it um, like, like 20 years back. And the tiki has so much mana that uh, when they developed the film, uh, the person standing next to it came out fine, but the tiki mysteriously doesn't, didn't appear in the photography. Um, this is uh, another, uh, a lot of folklore associated with this tiki. This tiki sits now in the Gauguin Museum, which is on the island of Tahiti in the Society Islands. It's one of the largest ancient stone tikis, again, outside of the Easter Island. And it's made of the red volcanic tooth, which most of the, most of the tikis are made of this red tooth, of the ancient tikis, um, because red was a, a sacred color in, in ancient Polynesia, as in other cultures, too, um, a symbol of royalty. Uh, so this, this tiki has a lot of folklore associated with it. We have another picture coming up, too. Is that like a granitic stone? Pardon? Is it granite? granite? Uh, it's volcanic. Yeah, but, is it granite? but it's a softer stone. Yeah, it's, it's soft. It's, yeah. it's a tooth, yeah. It's, yeah, it's not real hard. Go on there. I have another picture, uh, Walter. So, like, Doug, all these have this mana. They're all alive. They have this energy, right? Or, right. Or some no. Uh, well, um, uh, you know, as as the the religion gets more and more watered watered down, gets more west, westernized. You know, some of the tiki you still believe they have um, this this mana. Polynesian re, uh, religion. There's two things that are, that are integral to it. One is the concept of mana, which is which is it's a sacred energy that can be transferred, and it can be transferred from um, say, inanimate types of objects, say, a tiki, to uh, a biological um, a person, um, and, and it free flows. And it's, it's like almost like a, some of the tikis, another thing uh, the tikis could be is a vessel to hold this mana. Closely associated with mana is the concept of tapu, 
um, which our word taboo comes from. And taboo is basically ex 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 something that has so much of this mana or so, so much of this sacred energy that it really belongs to a royal, a royal class of people. And it's something that shouldn't be, be messed with. And that's why uh, tiki's lox times are found on sacred ground. And they, they demarcate sacred places. They're, they, they're found in these open air temples called the marae or the mie. And, um, and lots of times they are perceived to have bad luck, which um, this tiki, uh, again, this is in, the, um, in the, the Gauguin Museum in Tahiti, but it was originally from the Austral island of Raivive. And when they brought, in 1933, they loaded this tiki up along with um, the next one, uh, Walter, along with this smaller one. The, the smaller one here is male, and the, the first one I show you is, is a female. And they loaded them up on a boat in the, in the Raivive Harbor. And they, they also put, um, their child, uh, which is a smaller tiki, on the same, same boat. Now, when this boat took off, the, the, the child, the smallest tiki, fell in the water, and the, the, the natives at that time said, that's it, um, the tiki wanted to stay on our island so bad, you can't get this tiki. And they left it underwater until just um, about two months ago. That's a different story, I'll get to, that, get to that soon. But then the boat took off these two big tikis to uh, Tahiti, and when they docked into Papiete, which is the main town of Tahiti, they couldn't get any uh, Tahitians to unload these tikis because, of course, they had so much tapu or so much mana that the Tahitians knew that they were probably were, were, were imbued, you know, and they could cause bad luck because they were probably upset because they were taken from their natural environment. And so finally they found some Marquesan Islanders and they, they unloaded them and then there's all kinds of, you know, this is going back to the 1930s, but there's all kinds of mysterious stories that the, um, the people that unloaded it died that night. Um, when they finally got them over to the Gauguin Museum where, where they reside now, there's been, there's been stories that when they had the inauguration of the museum, that um, that day the, the, um, the gardener quit his job and then that night the, the person that worked in the gift shop mysteriously lost their life. So the, the story now is that the, the, the museum doesn't need to lock their doors because nobody's going to go over there at nighttime because these tiki's are there. <laughs> so, and did, don't they almost think that this one tiki murdered this that girl? Right. There's, there's, like there's, there, there's, another, there's another story. I'm glad you brought that up. There's another story where um, th this is sitting actually right in front of a, a real beautiful part of the ocean and that, that a, a woman went there and completely disrespectfully disrobed and put her garments, just draped her garments over the tiki while she went swimming. And then supposedly, like, there's all kinds of stories. Again, I mean, the most uh, simplest story is that uh, she started having so much bad luck that, um, that, uh, she, that she had to bring her family back and her elders back, and they had to do a ceremony in front of the tiki. Now, the most extreme story I heard, and, and it could be true, is that she, she died that night when she, after she draped her clothes. But again, you know, you have this, this, this thing. Um, I should probably talk about the oral tradition. We talked a little bit about that yesterday with the Egyptians. Um, you know, Polynesia is a place where, um, with the possible exception of the Rongo, Rongo Rongo writing that David brought up in his lecture yesterday in Easter Island, is a place that um, has a very strong oral tradition, but they did not necessarily have writing. And so um, the, the oral tradition, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very good way to pass down knowledge like the Vedic uh, system in India, you know, is a, is a, is a, is a thousands and thousands of year old tradition where, where very detailed knowledge is passed down in the way of rhymes and, and limericks and, and, and passages that are, that are memorized verbatim. And also ancestor worship is tied up in that same thing. They, they pass down, like um, I met people, I met one guy in the Cook Islands that could recite his ancestors, you know, by memory going back to the 1300s. And so, you know, it was very, very disciplined um, thing, but this, this ancestor worship, this oral history is very important. But, you know, the downside of that is possibility, kind of like the Paul Bunyan I was talking about earlier, you know, you, you talk about something so much and, and you might overemphasize, you know, some of the, like the traits and, and pretty soon somebody that was a great man might be, have become a great king or might become a great god. So um, that's the kind of the oral tradition. Keep going. So having started off the Austral Islands, um, I was very lucky. I was just there two months ago, and the day I got there was the day that they pulled the tiki up out of the harbor after it had been, been there since 1933. Um, this is called Raivive. They just put an airport in about a year ago, and I wanted to get there before the tourists did because it's one of the most beautiful islands I've ever been to. I'm sure they're going to set up a tourist infrastructure. But right now, there's no, there's no infrastructure for tourism. I had to stay in someone's home. And I was very lucky to go there. 
I'm, this, is, this picture is taken of the island. I'm standing on a motu. A motu is a little tiny sandy island that's part of the reef system that, that uh, surrounds a lot of these tropical islands. But it was just, it was just paradise. It was so beautiful. And did you get special permission to go to that island, or did Ken just go there? No, um, I don't speak French very well, so I had a, a friend of mine that spoke French, and, and I made a contact um, with somebody that I found out about was from Papiette, was renting rooms out of her house, and so she set it up for me to, to stay um, in somebody's house. This is the last tiki. This is, isn't the one that was underwater. This is the very last tiki that is on Rivive, and it still stands. Because like, like, like I said, after, they took, after that one tiki fell overboard or jumped overboard, they say, um, they don't allow any more tikis to leave the island. But, but uh, this island was really amazing because you just start going hiking in the bushes, and you find all kinds of you know, archaeological remnants, and, and, you know, which I'm sure that some were at these ancient uh, Maori sites. Um, now we're moving over to the Caroline Islands. This is a Tino figure. Um, it's, it's very Picasso-esque. In fact, um, in contemporary art, there is a school called Primitivism, and Picasso, of course, was one of these artists. And there was a show in, in New York uh, called Primitivism. And the show, actually, I thought it was one of the most incredible art shows ever, but it was not, it, it was not well received because it showed how contemporary artists literally you know, steal a lot of these primitive uh, icons and, you know, made millions on it. And like, you know, I mean, even Picasso, what was that quote by Picasso? He said, uh, uh, you know, bad artists copy, good artists, or great artists steal. You know, so this is part, you know, it's very Picasso-esque. And this is a very rudimentary uh, crude form um, called Tino. Um, try that again. I might have slipped on. Uh, Okay, this is the Tongaroa figure that um, I had on the cover of my Tiki book. Uh, it's uh, it's the, the, Cook, the Cook Islands, the, the god of the sea, the fisherman's god. Very important. Tongaroa, Ta'aroa. It's, it's the supreme god all over Western Polynesia and most of Eastern Polynesia as well. Um, and basically, the, the head is very distinctive um, in that the, the, the eyes and the mouth have a certain number of lines. And one, another definition of tiki is, is, is really a totemic coat of arms, uh, which like, um, uh, like Durkheim always talked about, you know, man and his totems. Um, uh, basically, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a coat of arms, just like, um, just like uh, the Europeans have their, their family name. This is something that can be traced back to the first ancestors. So it's a very distinctive, uh, you know, five lines in the eyes and four lines in the mouth. They mount these to the front of their ca canoe on the prow. And it, that literally becomes a flag. It represents, like, you, you know, anybody could identify, oh, there's so-and-so from, from Rorotonga, you know, Tongaroa from Rorotonga Island. Uh, the basic form of the tiki, there's m m many definitions. Uh, the lox tongues are, are they're very squat um, with uh, big bellies. The, the belly is also sacred in a lot of Polynesian uh, imagery. And um, the hands are oftentimes clasped over the belly or on its side. I've, I've been told that this, if the hands are, are clasped or uh, holding, it means they're holding on to their culture. They have a very rich culture that, um, you know, that, that lots of times the kids want to become more like a Madonna and, and the Western uh, people. So I try to talk to the elders about the, the, the original culture. So the hands symbolize holding on to the culture. The bent knee, um, David mentioned yesterday, the, the Cuso posture. This is a, a universal posture found you know, from, from Africa to New Guinea to uh, the Pacific to, uh, to a lot of Latin American art. You see these bent legs. Um, uh, I've done a lot of research on what these bent legs mean. Most, the first answer I usually get is the bent legs um, symbolize reverence. Sometimes, it, it, depending on the, the, the type of image, uh, the bent legs could represent aggressiveness or, or like um, uh, you know, ready to pounce on your opponent. But the usual answer I get is, um, is uh, praying or respect, you know, um, that type of thing. Uh, the, 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 the phallus. Uh, Many of these tiki's pre-Western contact, of course, uh, the mana that was part of the fertility, and many of them are are, are, are depicted with um, outstretched tongues or o overly developed uh, uh, vulvas or, or, or um, penises, and this is just a natural thing before missionary contact. There was no there was no uh, you know, negative connotations placed on sex. It was it was part of the the, the creation. All right. 
Again, this is a Marquesan figure with the overly emphasized uh, penis. Um, this is a very traditional Marquesan tiki, and which kind of ties into what we, a little bit of what we talked about here. The uh, telltale sign for Marquesan tiki is these goggles around the eyes that um, you know, some people, uh, like in the Eric von Donneken school, might perceive as, as being a, you know, a symbol for some sort of extra, extraterrestrial. All right. And then, of course, uh, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the matriarch, um, I, I believe that some of the earliest tikis were female tikis. Um, this is a, a female Marquesan tiki that um, I commissioned when I was there. And the Marquesan, the wood carving is phenomenal. This is the Asiatic, um, excuse me, the Oceanic uh, rosewood, which is a beautiful wood, and, and you can see the, the carving. There's also the Marquesans, believe it or not, before uh, Western contact, of course, they had the cross too. That's the Marquesan cross, and it's, um, it's a universal symbol throughout the Marquesan. Again, it's like the coat of arms for the Marquesas. Um, but the, the female, female form is found on a, on a lot of the most ancient tikis. I should say um, right now, too, is I believe the oldest tikis um, or possibly the oldest sculptures of mankind were most likely wood because wood was easier to carve than, than stone. But we see the reason the we see the, the most ancient uh, stones is because, of course, stone you know, lasts longer than wood, especially in a tropical, moist environment like, uh, like the Pacific. Okay? This is the detail of the of the vahin, vah Pardon? I'm just saying it's gorgeous. Yeah, isn't it nice? It's the vahini means uh, means female um, or woman in um, in Tahitian or or Polynesian, and this is what I call a vahini tiki. But it is gorgeous. It's just incredible wood carving. Doug, have you ever asked them about these goggle eyes and why the big eyes? You know, what if they ask so many questions, but I, uh, next time I go there, I'm going to ask that one. That, you know? Anyway, the, another thing, just like the word tiki is from the Marquesas, um, uh, the word tattoo is also from the Marquesas. They're, they have the most famous uh, tattooing in the world. And they're, they're, of course, the tiki design is integral to the, to the tattoos. And, and many, most of the tattoos, the traditional tattoos, tell a story. Go on. This is in the island of Fatuhiva. Um, I don't know if you Thor hired off fans in the audience probably recognize uh, the, the, the word Fatuhiva. That was the name of Thor Heyerdahl's second book, which really he experienced before Kontiki. And basically, when Thor Heyerdahl first got out of school and he got married to his first wife, Eve, he, he wanted to go back to nature. He wanted to be this noble, this, this noble savage thing. And he didn't realize that he was going to go on and do such great stuff because he just wanted to drop out of Western civilization. So he scoured the whole he, he scoured the world for the place that he wanted to live his whole life, and he found this little island in the southern Marquesas called Fatuhiva. And he moved there, and he actually lived there for a year, thinking he was going to live there for the rest of his life. But the mosquito infestation uh, was just so harsh, um, which I could, I could agree to, that he found you know, that, that indeed there is, uh, there is some trouble in paradise. So he, he, he moved from there, he moved from there, and um, then he went on to do Contiki and all the great stuff that he did. Uh, well, he, he also, there was something happened to him where he had to escape that island that they were trying to get him. Or right, right. There's, that's, a whole, that's a whole story. But if, if you want to read a, a great, if, you, if, you, if you've read Contiki and like that, Fatuhiva is, is a wonderful book. Um, these, are the, these are the best tattoo artists um, in another southern Marquesas island called um, Atuata. And these are the, the Fahey brothers. They're known to be the best tattoo artists. And Felix Fahey in the middle, um, I waited 20 years. I only had one tattoo, and he gave it to me. Okay? <laughs> All right. yeah, after, after the show, after the. <laughs> um, again, uh, the traditionally the, the, the tiki carving is done is done by males, but the, the females have as equally beautiful, if not more beautiful, art form, which is this tapa, tapa bark, and they have different kinds of tapa. Tapa is actually the they use it for materials and they make clothes out of it, and it's found throughout Polynesia and Micronesia, um, and a little bit in Melanesia, and also in Indonesia. And it's, uh, it's incredible. Uh, ironically, we probably look at the design first. To them, the design is secondary. The cloth is what's, what's really the quality product. This is a traditional Marquesan design that shows a, a traditional full body tattoo. And this is also on the island of Fatuhiva, which is known to have the nicest um, top, top of, um, cloth in the world. And that's a Vahini, right? That's a Vahini. I, I, I think that's a, that's a, that's a male. They actually have lovesticks there? Is he holding a lovestick? I thought that was indigenous to Palau only. 
Uh, this stick? That's a love stick. Uh, that that would be a, a club or a spear, but those designs, like, especially the concentric uh, well, designs. I think that that's a love stick. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. The, the, you know, I know the love sticks, but I think that is a spear. Something but the different. love sticks are like that. Yeah. That is also a famous Russian <coughs> old print. Right. Like that, that. Really? That's yes. But really? it's also interesting because you see these concentric circles, and this is another uh, what I believe is is a is a is a archetypical design where you have these circles facing each other. You see it all around the world, but especially in New Guinea um, and Melanesian art. And what is that on the head, like horns? Um, that, I, that's, that's, a, that, that's like a hair, hairstyle that like, they, they did traditionally. Yeah. Okay, Walter. This is on uh, Fatu Hiva. I just like this picture. I, I was walking around. It was raining. I was kind of bummed out. And I, I, I was my first day there. I didn't know anyone. And, yeah. and all of a sudden, you know, this lady comes running out of her house and she starts yelling, Tiki, Tiki. You know? and, and so I went over and this is a Tiki that her husband carved. And, and I just, I like this shot because it actually, you can see the Fatu Hiva written on the crate down there. All right. Um, this, this is Hanevave Bay, which is also on Fatu Hiva. You can see why Thor Heyerdahl thought, chose this place to live. But what's interesting is the natural rock formations, the, um, the simulacre, the, the similar natural formation that, that basically looks like tiki. And supposedly, we're going to get into Easter Island in just a minute, but supposedly the people that went on to inhabitate um, Easter Island started the Marquesas. And guess what? I'd say that looks like a Moai. Next one. And there's another picture of the same. It looks like a moai, doesn't it? And just, just a go gorgeous place, Fatu Hiva. Next slide. Uh, there's another, uh, there's another uh, rock that also looks like a moai that's, that's also there. Next. Was that just something you noticed, or is that known to be done? They're, they're famous rock formations. But I, I thought they looked like tiki's. Anyway, a quick. Uh, a quick overview of the Pacific, um, the Polynesia, you have what's called the Polynesian Triangle, which starts off uh, in the north in Hawaii, and it goes, it goes down uh, to about Fiji, where, where's Fiji, about right there, and then it crosses all the way over to Easter Island, and then back up. So this is called the Polynesian Triangle, one of the um, largest uh, places on Earth. Micronesia, uh, which is uh, uh, micro meaning small, and is Basically, the, the Polynesian and Micronesia are like, the same source of, source of people. I mean, they're basically the best sailors in the world. Um, and they, they, the, there's, there's, there's three different theories that I want to, just want to briefly present to you. The most uh, academically accepted theory is that they migrated out of Southeast Asia. Possibly, um, possibly uh, um, one theory is they started around Taiwan and went over the Philippines and then came, came, came down in boats and through a strong desire of trading or possibly warfare, um, gradually migrated, gradually out in the Pacific. Now there's some people that say they went out to Micronesia first, that's called the Micronesian route. There's other people that say um, Indonesia was the homeland and there's also theories um, that we could talk about all day that, that Indonesia might be the real Atlantis um, because, and, that, because it, um, and that they came out of Indonesia and they came across the sea either the Micronesian route or the Melanesian route um, bypassing uh, New Guinea. You find the Austronesian language, which is the largest language group in the world. Um, and uh, the Austronesian language, believe it or not, it goes all the way to Madagascar, you know, which would be over here off the coast of Africa, all the way to Easter Island. And, and the Austronesian language, um, that's, that's the linguistics, that's um, why anthropologists believe that this is, this is the, um, this was the, probably the way they migrated. The other theory, the Thor Heyerdahl theory, is that there was a South American connection. South America would be over here. And that um, at least some of the Pacific was, was populated by way of South America, which, um, which I definitely believe there was a connection. Uh, Thor Heyerdahl showed in his art of Easter Island that there was um, many, many commonalities. The, the QZO posture um, amongst them, the hand placement we were going over earlier. Why don't we flip the, the slide? Um, this, this, is, this, this shows, this is a maritime uh, culture, and obviously the, the tiki builders came through Indonesia. This is the Indonesian island of Sulawesi, the central, central part of the island, and this is, this, is a, this is definitely a tiki, so the tiki builders definitely passed through here. Next. Wow, that is huge. Yeah, isn't that awesome? Yeah. 
In fact, I was going to propose that we should, we should travel there. Yeah. <laughs> and then, then this is all the way over to Peru. This is Machu Picchu. This is a little trinket I picked up um, in, uh, in, uh, in Cusco. And I hiked up to Machu Picchu, brought it with me, set up the coca leaves. And, and uh, basically, this, is, this would be akin to what Thor hired all called Contiki, or otherwise known as Baracocha Contiki. Um, go on to the next slide. Uh, the Contiki would be the bearded sun god. Um, there's a lot of books. David's catalog, you know, has some some great books on on, on Contiki or Viracocha, um, is one of the titles he has. And basically, uh, Thor Heyerdahl believed that that that, that the, the tiki here in Tiwanaku, Bolivia, was the same that they had in the Marquesas, and they both they, it was basically the sun the sun god that was worshipped, you know, from South America into the Pacific, and um, this is this is interesting. When I was when I was there last uh, year with David, I asked uh, some locals all about this. Uh, uh, one person told me it was actually was a female with wearing this bearded mask to show the um, the you know the 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 male female uh, ambi um, uh, uh, component of, of man. And it's also it's hard to see in this slide, but the, it has a very interesting hand uh, placement. Um, uh, which uh, they were telling me uh, was was significant um, too. Um, the the seafaring sea expeditions. This is a this is a boat that was in Lake Titicaca that um, David was talking about yesterday too. Um, the the reed boats. Uh, Thor hired all proved that they they are very efficient sailing vessels, and that the, the reed also grows. You can find it on the Easter Island in the craters, and so the, the Polynesians couldn't build building boats like this as they did in the raw expeditions came, coming from Egypt and in Lake Titicaca. This is a, a, a really neat uh, boat I found in Marquesas, but it shows, it shows a seafaring expedition. What's really unique is look at this guy out here, the prisoner, um, on, the, on the back of the boat. Here's a close-up of the prisoner there on the back of the boat. Um, next. And this is, this is incredible. This is the island of Tonga. This is a seafaring boat that, that traveled all around the Pacific. There's not one piece of metal in this boat. Of course, um, uh, the Polynesian culture um, was Neolithic. They did not um, have benefit of the use of metal until uh, the Westerners showed up, but they were perfectly um, fine. They built these seafaring vessels, and they were the Micronesians and the Polynesians, again, were the best sailors in the world. Uh, now it comes to my third theory. I've already talked about the Asian theory and the South American theory. So I, I typically, I try to seek out old timers um, for my research. And so I met this guy on a ferry going, uh, on a ferry going over to um, uh, 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 Savaiki, uh, the big main island of, in Samoa. And I started a, a conversation with this gentleman. And, and I, so I, when my, after I get to know somebody, I always go, well, do you believe your ancestors are from the east or from the west? And this guy gave me a very novel Answer, he said. He said we're not from either. We're from above, <laughs> you know. And and so and Savaiki is very close to the term Havaiki, and Havaiki is believed to be the ancestral homeland of the myth mythological, at least ancestral homeland of the Polynesians, which is up. Yeah, and Doug, I, I mentioned yesterday how Ultra Samoa, the, the ancient Samoan kings lived on Manoa, and they supposedly could fly, and they flew from island to island. Right. Well, that's up too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. I, I'm,
Great. But the, 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 kava, the kava chewing is, is common throughout the, the Western Pacific. OK, next. I've had kava. Crazy stuff. It, it, it's like drinking Novocaine. <laughs> right. First your lips go numb, then your cheeks go numb, then your fingertips and your toes. And pretty soon, you try to stand up and you just fall over. Right. And um, Western, I mean, excuse me, uh, Micronesia is known to have the best kava, too. <laughs> Got that big bowl at home. Okay, great. This, this, you know, a lot of people don't associate the Pacific with megalithic construction either. Now, these are called the Langis. These, these are incredible. You know, you know, you know, they're not quite, you know, where Cusco or or or, or Egypt is, but, but but you know, people don't know that this stuff's out in the Pacific too. These, this is called a Langi. It's like a, basically a, a base of a pyramid. Um, now, some people think there were structures on top of them. And they're not sure. Some people say that they're they're grave sites, but there's a lot of other um, uh, explanations for them too. But but the, these are big, massive you know blocks of coral that supposedly uh, they got from an island that was 800 miles away, and they and they put double hold canoes together um, to transport them. Um, this is also in Tonga. This is some more of the, the carving. This is a, 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 a whale's tooth. It's a traditional figure. Um, just another common archetype is these, these, these diametrically opposed figures called Janus images. images. You, you find these types of images all over the world. And I think it, it, it has to do with the Taoism or, the, or like the male female element. This is, this is an exquisite carving. Um, this is a close up of the top of that. Um, of that uh, swordfish sword that I, I showed you on an earlier slide, but you can see uh, you can see the tiki like like image uh, very finely carved in it. Uh, this is a, a close up of the langi. Now again, the, the the construction it doesn't have notched grooves like you saw at the um, at the uh, the valley a temple next to the Sphinx or or like what you saw in Cusco. But you do look at that. There's like there's a, there is a, definitely a key cut in there, and these are these are pretty serious megaliths here. And another view of the Langi. Um, and then, then again, they have the, uh, the they have a, like a, a kind of miniature Stonehenge right here in Tonga too. And this is this is definitely is astronomically uh, oriented. And um, there's another picture. And it's a pretty significant archaeology. This right there, there in Tonga that a lot of people don't know about. In fact, I think on the back of David's uh, logo, your logo on the back of your shirt, it has the. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Kind of a t-shirt. The, uh, they have manga found there. Yeah, yeah the tri Trilithion. Um, this, this I'm showing, this is, this is right near the Trilithion site. And remember I was talking about the different theories of the bent, of the bent knee to Cusio posture. I came up with another theory on why they have bent knees in Tonga. And the Tongans that I talked to just love my theory. Basically, this is a famous rock. And, and uh, one of the Tui Tongas, Tui Tonga is like the, um, the kings, the past king lineages of Tonga. One of, the, one of them was, was known to be very mean and, had, and was, was very mean to their slave workers. And while they were building some of this megalithic construction, he was known to um, have to stand with his back against the stone because he'd always be hitting um, his slaves. Now, where he'd be hitting his slaves was in their knee. So I told him, well, maybe one of the reasons why tikis have these bent legs is because they're running around, you know, because they they're holding on their knees because this this king was hitting, striking them in the knee. <laughs> but, all right, next. This this is an important place. This is in Fiji, and this is uh, where the Lapita um, pottery. This is the far farthest west the Lapita pottery has been traced. Uh, the anthropologists that believe in the Asian uh, migrations have traced similar pottery shards all the way from the Philippines and Southeast Asia all the way through Mel Melanesia into the Pacific and then here into Fiji. And how old is Lapita pottery supposed to be? Um, Definitely BC. I don't. Three thousand years. Three, yeah, one thousand BC. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's Next. Old. Yeah, definitely old. Uh, this is this is Fijian. Fijian is is a little bit Melanesian, a little bit of Micronesian, and a little bit of Polynesian. It's very much of a crossroads place in the Pacific, and you can see that a lot of their art is definitely like Pol Polynesian or, or Micronesian. This is a a bowl that uh, they use to put the um, the moni or the, the sacred coconut oil in, but it's definitely a, a tiki sort of figure. And uh, our, our diffusionist in the room, uh, you know, it almost looks like a Sasquatch type of, type of figure, too. <laughs> okay? Son of Kong. Right. <laughs> and this is another Fijian, a, a, real, a real nice carving. This is a traditional food hook. You can see the big plate here. This was to avoid um, 
uh, they, they could hang uh, food from these hooks down here, and then the rats and, and rodents couldn't, couldn't uh, get to the food, so they, they'd hang their food off of these types of hooks. And then, of course, you've heard of the cannibalism. This is a, 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 finally, uh, a cannibal fork. Um, uh, again, the, the cannibalism was, was really associated with Fiji, but in a way, it was, it was found in a lot of Melanesian islands, and this is known as the cannibal's fork. Uh, the, 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 again, they, they had the concept of mana as well, and um, there was so much mana in, in their food that they weren't allowed to touch it, so they had to use a special uh, fork. And now we're out into the Cook Islands. Um, this is, again, this is uh, sailing out to Amotu, which are those little tiny islets that surround these tropical islands. This is, uh, I have this slide in here because this is the prow of the canoe I was on. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a tiki, but the old, the old traditional canoes, this is where you find those tikis that I said were like the coat of arms, right here on the prow. And then this is a Tongan, an, another female form. If you haven't, if you can't tell, I'm partial to the female forms, so I try to have a lot of them in this presentation. This is from the island called Atutake, which is um, in the Cook Islands, and it's called the Atutake Goddess. And then uh, the, the Cook Islanders, um, especially in Atutake and Rorotonga, they pride themselves on having the, 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 the fastest dancing in all the Pacific, and it's really um, incredible that if you go there, uh, the, the music is just slightly faster than, than the Hawaiians and the Tahitians. It's very fast-paced, um, uh, frenzy sort of dance, but it's just gorgeous. Um, uh, the, the, the Polynesians, well, all the, all the um, Pacific cultures, very holistic. Everybody took part in the dance and the music and the art. You know, either you made the costumes, uh, you carved the tikis, um, or you participated with the music and the dance. So it's not like, like hey, are you an artist? No, I'm a, I'm a mathematician. You know, everybody's an artist in a way, a musician or artist. This is a famous Cook um, Island image from Rorotonga. You have the Tongaroa on top. This is called a staff god. And you can, you can see Tongaroa, he's the leader of the generation. And these are, these are the, all the ancestors tracing back. And these, um, these, these effigies were, were burned when the missionaries got there. There's very few of them left. But um, they were, um, some of them were as high as 13 feet. Here's a detail of the, of the ancestral lineages on the same carving. This is uh, um, uh, Michael Taviano. Um, he's the most famous wood carver in all of uh, Cook Islands. Uh, again, there's a Tongaroa figure. Uh, these, these are the famous clubs that um, uh, Peter Buck cataloged uh, so well. Uh, Peter Buck was one of the most famous anthropologists in the Pacific in the early 1900s. But you can see the, it's very, it's, it's, this is a war club, and it's, it's very traditional design. Uh, there you have uh, your, your eye, which is um, a, a universal um, symbol, you know, Egyptian and, and Pacific and, and Central American, uh, as well as all over the world. The, the eye shape, the serrated edges here, tracing it down, and you got a phallic uh, butt end here. Very, very nice craftsmanship. And then now we're on, we're, we are on Hawaii now, which is known as Raiatea. If you, if you trace that triangle I showed you, this is smack dab in the middle of the, of the Polynesian Triangle. It's called Raiatea. It's on the leeward uh, side of the Society Islands, and it is known to be the ancestral homeland of the Hawaii, of the, of the Polynesians. This is uh, the biggest, this is the most sacred Marae um, in all the Pacific, and um, it's known as Tapu Tapu Tea. Notice the tapu, tapu, uh, twice. It's like so sacred you have to say it twice in the name. And this is, this is what Peter Buck called a coronation stone, which is basically upright. Now, there's many explanations for these. I believe that these were the, you know, the first uprights that later on turned into this tiki, into, into anthropomorphic forms. You know, uh, uh, humankind was looking for, for uh, an image of, of God or, or gods, and this gradually became that. Uh, other people say that, the, that there were giants there, the Polynesians were giants, and this, this stone was used to measure uh, the warrior, and, 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 uh, and the warriors were, were eight feet tall um, in those days. Next. Another shot of the, same, of the same coronation stone. And you can see up here the uprights. Uh, the Maoris here are a little bit different. They had altars in the back of them um, with these upright stones. And this, this tiki guards this marae. Now, I went there my first time, and I didn't know this tiki was there. I completely missed it. But I just went there a couple of months ago and, and found this little tiki. It was only like a two-foot tall tiki, but it, gu it, guards, it guards the marae. Uh, I met an anthropologist there, or archaeologist, and he told me that he snuck a little uh, 
ship off the back, and um, and he dated that he dated that ship, which um, I find hard to believe, but he says it was 2,000 years old. Went back to the time of Christ. This tiki. Where was that on Raitea? Raitea, yeah. This is another little tiki um, that's also on the altar, uh, ancient tiki on the altar um, in Raitea, um, Tapu Tapu Tea. Um, now we're back in Tahiti. Uh, this is a, a famous, uh, famous uh, site with um, ancient stone tikis. This is one of the most, uh, um, on Tahiti, this is a restored Maori. Go on to the next slide. You can see this is the backside of the Maori. And it's, um, again, you don't have the, 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 the megalithic construction like you see in Egypt, but these, these, these are pretty impressive and they were outdoor temples. Um, this is a different style. This is on Wahini, um, which is in the, the Leeward Islands, a, a different style of Maori, a sacred site. And then here we are in Easter Island, uh, Thor Heyerdahl, one of my other favorite books is called Aku Aku, um, Thor Heyerdahl's third book after Fatu Hiva, and he, he went there and, and keep going, and uh, did, did some research, I believe it was like in the late, no, I think it was in the early 1960s, he wrote this book. And this, this quarry, uh, this quarry called Rani Raraku, um, is, is where, is where they, they, um, they carved the, te the, the, the moais, which these figures are called. They carved them in this quarry, and then they moved them. There's all different types of theories on how they moved them. Go on to the next slide. Here's, here's a picture of the side of the quarry. Now, these tikis, or these tikis are just left there abandoned. The, the theory is that there was a slave class and a ruling class, and, and after a while, a slave class just said, you know, we don't like doing this anymore, and they took over the, the ruling class. Go on to the next slide. Um, this is the lone moai, which is near the Rana Rabaku quarry, but it's, uh, Thor hired all in particular like this tiki because it had a little uh, goatee, the, the, the bearded uh, sun god again. No, keep going. And then this would have been, this, this is about 73 feet tall. This would have been the largest tiki or the largest moai in the world had they pulled out of this quarry. But you do see how they carve them, they carve them in situ, um, in place, and they break through, kind of like what they did in Egypt with the, um, with the uh, obelisks that we watched yesterday. And, but they never, um, it was just left in, in situ here, um, probably because they, um, the, the, like I said, the slaves overthrew the uh, ruling class. But you can see, there, that's my picture. Well, there, there I am there, and you can see how big it is. Go, go on. A after the Moai building in Easter Island, they turned to what was called the Birdman cult. Um, throughout all the islands I've ever gone to, um, birds are very much respected by the traditional cultures because birds obviously have the ability to fly from island to island, and so um, the, the bird image is very important. After the Moai building stopped, which is probably sometime around the 1600s, the island supposedly reverted to this birdman cult. I don't know if you can see the petroglyphs, but there's, there's a bird carved here. And this is called Arango, which is on, the, on, a, on a one extreme end of Easter Island. These little Motu rock islands are offshore. And it's a very spiritual place. You can actually, in this shot, you can actually see the curvature of the earth. And um, you know, this is, I, all these shots I'm using are film. I have not enhanced. I have not enhanced any, any, uh, any of these photographs, but very quickly, the Birdman cult, um, they, had, they had little uh, uh, chieftains all over the island, and once a year they get together, and an adolescent male would be, would be um, uh, used to compete in the Birdman contest, and what they'd have to do is they'd have to climb down from these rocks down this real steep face here that would inevitably get, um, get blood on them, and then swim through these shark-infested waters all the way out to the largest motu, which is about a mile offshore, and they'd have to get the egg of a sacred turn. And they get they put the egg inside of the headband they'd have around their, their head, then swim back to the shark infested waters, and yeah, some of them got eaten by sharks, and then they have to climb back up the face, and the first adolescent male to get an intact egg to the chieftain of their district of the island and hand it to him, that chieftain becomes the bird man, which is, is in essence the king of the island. The, the adolescent male that, that gets it back to them intact is basically treated like royalty for the rest of their lives, and all the other adolescent males that compete in the contest just get slaughtered. Is that right? So they were, they were killed? Yeah. They were killed them. Okay, yep. really? Yes. This is a famous Easter Island figure called, Mo it's also called a Moai. Moai basically in, in, in Easter Island means a figure. Um, but this is called Moai Kava Kava, and it's very famous. Uh, this is made out of the Oceanic Rosewood, which is now extinct in Easter Island. Um, and, um, but uh, the figure, they, they think that this comes from a famine, a time when there was no food, and that's why it's so skinny. 
Let's keep going. Uh, now we're over into Micronesia. This is Yap. Yap's famous for their megalithic stone money. I've been told I only have like about four minutes left, so I just want to run through a few more images quickly. Okay. Um, this is this is one of the, yeah. Uh, Micronesia does not have that much uh, anthropomorphic imagery, but this is uh, this is called the, um, the Tapuana Tapuano mass. Again, Tapu is in the name of these masks, and they're um, they're really neat uh, figures uh, from Yap. There's one up close. And then here, this is interesting. This is a, a little eff effigy, again, Janus. You can see there's a, there's a head on the back side, a Janus figure that they would hang on their canoes and supposedly brought, brought the fishermen good luck. And then this is uh, in Yap as well. Yap, Yap um, they, they learned a long time ago that to build a successful road, they needed irrigation, just like the Romans knew and the Egyptians and, and a lot of other cultures learned. So consequently, uh, they have roads that are over 1,000 years old, which this, this is one of. This is, um, this is the la uh, latte stone from, from Guam, uh, the Mariana Islands, and they're found throughout there. The common explanation of these things, they're found throughout the islands. The, the common explanation is that there are some sort of stelts uh, for homes, but, uh, but I think, along with other people in the room, think that they had a more, um, a more, a, another more deeper um, uh, purpose. And then this is, this is the island of Palau. They have large stone uprights there, too. Keep, keep going. And they have fantastic uh, storyboard carving, a very excellent wood carving there. This is a, a storyboard, basically tells a, tells a story. Um, and uh, keep going. This, this is found all the way over in Palau. It's a sacred stone. But it, it's, it's amazing because people that are interested in Easter Island archaeology have found this stone. I think that there somehow is a, a link between Easter Island, which is on one side of the Pacific, and Palau, which is almost to the Philippines, on the other side of the Pacific, um, because specifically they have these top knots that are, that are the same, uh, almost like the Moai and the way the Polynesians wore their traditional ha uh, hair. This is, this is uh, where I found this, 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 uh, this upright here, next to another uh, sacred stone. Um, it's a funny story, but I, I looked all over the island for this, and I went on a hike, and I hiked for at least, for at least five miles, you know, sweating up this hill, and got thorns in my socks. I just couldn't find it, and so I was all discouraged. And I walked all the way back down to my car, and about within an eighth of a mile of my car, right when I thought it was all over, I stumbled on them, and they were all the way down at the bottom of the hill. <laughs> So I felt pretty lucky to find him. And then this is a, a monkey man figure from Palau. Again, you, you see it's the, the, the kneeling uh, QZO posture. A uh, little bit different hand gestures, but still respect um, covering the torso. And pretty, pretty unique uh, tiki-like figure. And then this is an anthropomorphic uh, figure in Palau. You can see the, the eyes and, and um, the nose, the mouth here. And then all over Palau, as with um, a lot of areas of Micronesia, you get these uh, picture plants, which are the, the carnivorous plants. And this is where this is the area you can see where the stones are in Palau. And again, the, ex the common explanation is that these were ancient foundations of some sort of houses, but I think that they had more significance than that. Um, now we're into Ponape. I'm going to leave you in Ponape. This is, uh, this is uh, where uh, Edgar Casey or proponents of Lemuria or the Lost Continent of Mu, uh, keep going, Church. Uh, believe that there's an there's a ancient place called Namadal. It's this ancient city, again, not known to a lot of pe people, but there's these ancient ruins in the middle of the Pacific that are, that are pretty phenomenal. And, um, uh, David, David wrote a great book about uh, Micronesia where he talks about these, but it's just amazing how they moved these, uh, these, these, these stones into, into place and made this ancient city. Keep going. Uh, this is the side. You can see the megalithic construction. It was, it was, again, not quite where Peru or Egypt was at, but, but definitely significant megaliths that a lot of people don't realize are sitting out in the Pacific. Um, this is a, a similar megalith that are found in Kosarai, which is another Micronesian island. Um, but, um, you know, pr pretty impressive megalithic uh, ancient citadel. Uh, keep going. Um, really quickly, New, New Guinea is the, where we're going to stop this thing at, but, you know, the, the, a lot of the New Guinea figures have the bent leg posture. The, the, um, the interior Sepik region happens to have my favorite primitive art in the world. I just want to run through some of these figures really quickly. 
Uh, this is the Sepik River, or, um, which shows you uh, the, these villages. And one thing about uh, diffusionism, uh, the, the isolationists, if, if anywhere in the world uh, there's a good argument for the isolationists or the inventiveness school of, um, of, of humanity, it would be the Sepik because you have villages within five miles of each other along this river, and, but each village has its own language, its own art, its own cosmology because there was so much tribal war and it kind of, uh, it, it blows a lot of the uh, anthropologist's mind because Generally, you think if you live near someone, you're going to take on some of their traits through trading. But, but even when I was just there a couple of years ago, I would walk from one village to another, and everybody would be friendly. They'd walk along with me, and all of a sudden, everybody would stop. And I'd be like on my own for you know maybe for about um, an eighth of a mile, and all of a sudden, the people from the new village would come out and meet me. There's always like this demarcation of a no man's land because of the tribal war that went on there. Uh, the, the crocodile is very sacred um, uh, in the Sepik region, the only uh, natural predator of man. And they, so the fronts of their canoes where the tikis were in Polynesia, uh, the, the, the crocodile becomes on their, their canoes. Uh, this is another great mask on, on, in, a, in a sacred longhouse. The, the, mud, the mud people are very famous from New Guinea. And uh, I, this is a great you know, tiki-like image that this, this woman uh, carved. And then this is a, a sacred uh, uh, men's initiation house, again with the tiki-like uh, anthropomorphic imagery on the back wall. And these, these boys are actually, they have to stay in this house during their, uh, their adolescent time when they're turning into men. And this is some of the close-up of the design in the house. I'm probably out of time, but why don't we, why don't we just go ahead and stop it? it what, what? Yeah, that was good. And I, I have a few questions and stuff too. You know, I want to mention one thing too there, Doug, was that uh, like in Nan Madal the, and Ponape, that one of the legends there was that those giant basalt columns that they flew them through the air and levitated right. and put them there, that's, that's their thing. Doug also has a, um, a, a trip coming up to the Marquesas and stuff like that, and he has a flyer. Yeah, I have a flyer. If anybody's interested, next October, we're going to go, it's, it's, it's an incredible deal. We're going to go to three island groups, the Society Islands, the Tuamotu Islands, and the Marquesas Islands. And it's all expense paid. It's, it's very reasonable. All your food and uh, airfare from Los Angeles is included. So I have these flyers. Anybody that wants one, um, just come and see me. We have a minute, yeah. Is there any questions? You know, one thing about tattoos, too, and I know tattoo, you were saying, is a Marquesan word, but also they think that tattooing originated in Egypt. And that, like, also in the Bedouins and stuff like that, in the deserts, also the women, they tattoo the, their faces. And they I'm just saying that the word originated the word, there. I, Definitely I know, tattooing I is, yeah, yeah, yes. Right. <laughs> but I'm just making that connection to ancient Egypt. Right. That, yeah, the tattooing was something that went on there in the, you know, the Arabian deserts. David has an incredible book in his catalog that he, he actually forced me to buy, but I'm so glad he forced me to buy it. It's by uh, this guy named Perry, uh, the, the, the children of the... Children of the, sun. the Children of the yeah. Sun is all about how Egyptians uh, were in uh, the Pacific. It's a fascinating book written in the 1920s by, by a very early diffusionist. And it's, um, it, it's not an easy read. You probably only read about 10 or 20 pages at a time. Yeah, but there's, the yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's all about the Egyptians basically and, and Indians from, Hin from India going out into the Pacific and settling the Pacific. It was written by a professor of the University of, of Manchester, actually. Well, it's a great book on going out there. John White has written a book about Egyptian hieroglyphs. No, no, sure. <laughs> so we have, this is one of our reprints with Adventures Unlimited, and uh, it's only been out about a year or so. That was good, Doug. Hey, great. Thanks. Thanks.